Good morning, everyone in YouTube. Welcome to our service this morning. So, scripture reading this morning, I've taken from three different verses. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own ways. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, endures through every circumstance. First John 4, 15 to 17. All who declare that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. God is love. And all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment. But we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. And then Matthew 1, 18 to 21. And this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace Mary publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Let us pray. Father God, we just praise your name this morning. May your love fill our hearts and may it come from out, from inside to outside to others as we share the Christmas story with others, as we live it out in our community. Bless our service today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I entitled this message, Love of Another Kind. Love is a central theme throughout the Bible. From the beginning of creation in Genesis to the future of humanity in Revelation, God reveals his love for all of us. In his book, The Four Loves, by one of my favorite authors, C.S. Lewis, he elaborates on the theme of God's love found in 1 John chapter 4. And he says God is love. When, I, when he says, when he wrote this book, he says, I, when I first tried to write this book, I thought about his maxim, how it would provide me with a very plain high road throughout the whole subject. So I thought to myself, I should be able to say that human loves deserved to be called loves at all, just in so far as they resemble that first love from God. The first distinction that he made was therefore between what he calls gift love and need love. The typical example of gift love would be that love which moves a man to work and plan and save for the future well-being of his family. And that he would die without sharing or seeing. And of the second, that which sends a lonely or frightened child to its mother's arm. That's the need love. There was no doubt which was more like love himself, divine love, because it's gift love. The father gives all he is and has to the son, and then the son gives himself back to the father and gives himself to the world, and for the world to the father, and thus gives the world in himself back to the father. In other words, reconciliation, reconcile back. And what, on the other hand, can be less like anything that we believe of God's life than the need love. God lacks nothing. Our need love, as Plato once said, is the son of poverty. 
It is the accurate reflection in consciousness of our actual nature. We need God. We are need love. We are born helpless. And as soon as we are fully conscious, we discover loneliness. We need others physically and emotionally, intellectually. We need them if we are to know anything even about ourselves. Every Christian would agree that a man and woman's spiritual health is exactly proportional to their love for God. But man's love for God, from the very nature of the case, must always be very largely and must often be entirely of need love. This is obvious when we implore forgiveness for our sins and support in our tribulations and trials. But in the long run, it is perhaps even more apparent in our growing, for it ought to be growing awareness that our whole being, by its very nature, is one vast big need. Incomplete, preparatory, empty yet cluttered, crying out for him who can untie things that are now knotted together and tie up things that are still dangling loose. It goes on to say that man and woman can never bring to God anything at all but the sheer need love. Exalted souls may tell us of a reach beyond that. And then Luke and Paul in the scripture and John write about love. Love of God for all of us when they pen the words from his spirit onto paper. If we look at the birth of Jesus, for example, that I, that I read this morning, we see how God expressed his love for us and for the outcast people, such as the shepherds, as his message of hope and peace and love were given first to them, to the lowly shepherds. This was something much bigger than they understood as he could have picked another group of people to first hear the good news of great joy. But he chose the shepherds. The love of the shepherds expressed as protection to their own flock would be expressed also from the good shepherd Jesus to his own flock. And then I think of Joseph. Joseph is seldom ever singled out as someone who represents God's love, but he did. As we read in this section in Matthew, we notice key words that describe his own character. When the scripture says, Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man. To be righteous before God means that he kept the Messianic Mosaic law and was an upright man. One commentary states that while Luke's version of the story of Jesus' birth focuses more on Mary's experience, Matthew is now describing it from Joseph's point of view and his perspective. Mary and Joseph were betrothed to be married, something far more formal than a modern engagement. This likely meant that Joseph had made an agreement with Mary's father and mother, perhaps some years before that, to take Mary as his wife. The agreement was binding. It was legal. They were as good as married, other than the wedding ceremony, and they were physically building the relationship. But I believe that Joseph loved Mary, Mary very much. His kindness and love toward her meant that before he found out that God was supplying their child, that God brought Jesus to become the man-child, God-child, Mary was carrying a divine son of God. So he wanted to quietly divorce her, not cause any public disgrace or ridicule. That's showing great love for her. This speaks of a deep, deep love that he had, that he would continue on as a nurturing husband and father, training Jesus in his earthly duties as a carpenter. I often wonder what it was like for Jesus to be under the direction of his earthly father, Joseph. I wonder about the love that Jesus had for his parents as he watched them carry out their lives from day to day, their offices of work and their toil. Observing Joseph as he carried pieces of wood that would become sticks of lumber 
and blocks that would be turned into bowls and maybe toys to be sold for children. I query whether Jesus would be filled with joy as he took this all in. I believe that this household was filled with a great deal of love as they sat around the table after a hard day's work in the heat, in the dust, discussing all the accomplishments of a family. His earthly parents sacrificed much to take on this task given to them by their heavenly father. And Jesus would eventually sacrifice everything that he had, his life and love for all of humanity. Advent is about waiting. It's about that anticipation. And Christmas is only a week away. And Christmas is about the love of God for all of mankind. It's about a sacrifice of giving. It's a sacrifice of our life, for the, his life, for the entire world and our life back to him. We are called to sacrifice all for God. Remember the role of the Christian church as we give of our time and our talents to extend the kingdom of God into our world and into our communities. Earlier, I quoted from C.S. Lewis in his book, The Four Loves. The four loves found in scripture are eros, storage, philia, and agape. Eros is what we would call romantic love. This includes love found in the Song of Solomon in the Old Testament, but it can also be used in unhealthy ways as we know in our world today. Storage in the Bible or storage refers to love between family and members of the family. So we can think of many examples of storage you can find in the Bible between the many families mentioned like Noah and his children, the fathers and mothers devoted to their children, Ruth and Naomi, and then the Christmas family of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Philia, you've probably heard of the city of Philadelphia. It's considered the city of brotherly love. That's because this form of love is Greek, and it means the deep emotional bonds that connect two people. Often this is exemplified in friendship, but really it's also extended to those who show love and care for others outside of their own family for their neighbor. We see examples of this kind of love between David and Jonathan, and even in John 13, 35, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And then agape, the highest form of noble love, reserved for the love that God has for all of us. Agape is what Jesus demonstrated on the cross for us by sacrificing his love and taking on the entire burden of sin for all of humanity so that we could have everlasting life with him. During this time in Advent, we can reflect on the wondrous love of God for all of us as he opened up heaven and sent his son as a ransom for us. The gift of eternal life through Jesus is the greatest expression of love and philia or philia, love for one another, a commandment and a witness. I think of this song, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch, his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Can you feel his love as we approach Christmas? If we move away from all of the commercialism and trappings during Christmas, all the commercials that entice us to pay on time for that special someone, all the hubbub in the malls and the stores, we can then peel away and peer into the vast ocean of love that God has bestowed on us through his son, Jesus. One of the greatest expressions of God's love that can be accomplished in us is a filial love toward our fellow members of humanity. As we welcome God's love into our hearts and minds, we can exhibit that same love that he first gave us and extend it to someone else. It doesn't have to be just at Christmas. It can be forever as we are called to come along someone who is lonely 
and sick and in need throughout the year. I want to end with this passage from Romans 8. Only I want to read it this time in the message. So what do you think? With God on our side like this, how can we lose? If God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition, exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, is there anything else that he would, wouldn't would gladly and freely do for us? And who would even dare to tangle with God by messing with one of God's chosen? Who would dare to point a finger? The one who died for us, who has raised to life, was raised to life for us, is in the presence of God at this very moment sticking up for us. Do you think Anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and God's love for us? There is no way. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in Scripture. They kill us in cold blood because they hate you. We're sitting ducks, ducks because they pick us off one by one. But none of this phases us because Jesus loves us. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our master, has embraced us. Amen. Our closing hymn is Infant Holy, Infant Lowly. Let's stand and sing if we're able. <laughs> And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Lord, we echo the words of Paul's prayer as we worship you today. Help us all to know your love. Amen. Peace to you all.